A very happy morning to you all. My name is Sujani, consultant from Narayana Hrudayalaya, Bangalore. It's a beautiful day, and I hope you are all are ready with, for this tea webinar with that cup of fresh, invigorating coffee. For those of you who could not attend yesterday, a small recap. We had excellent research paper presentations, the Golden Fate Contest, an echocardiographic assessment of mitral wall, iota, arctic wall, and advanced imaging techniques in congenital heart diseases. I'm glad to tell you that we had a robust audience, close to 5,000, trying to update and master in, the, in this field of echocardiography, reflecting the improvement in the patient care and management. Now, on behalf of ACTA, I thank you all for joining us for the third and last day of 6th International and 15th National IACTA's Transesophageal Echocardiography Webinar. Please note, the registered candidates who attend all the three days will be awarded with three credit hours from Karnataka Medical Council. I'd like to cover a few housekeeping topics before we get started. We are pleased to hear from you. We'll be running a live question and answer at the end of the session. So if you have any queries, please pop them into the chat box. We'll be answering them live or we'll be mailed back to you. To keep the quality of sound functional during the meeting, please mute yourself when you're not sharing. Now, without further ado, let's get started with the first session of the day. In this, we have paper presentations of interesting images and case reports. For this, I invite eminent moderators, Dr. Kumar Bellani, Professor of Anesthesiology at Medical School, University of Minnesota, Dr. Rajesh Arya, Senior Consultant at Hero Heart Center, Ludhiana. He's also the Secretary of IACTA. And Dr. Manisha Mishra, Senior Director, Cardiac Anesthesia and Critical Care at the Medicity Gurgaon. She has numerous publications and presentations. May I now request Dr. Kumar Balani to take over the floor and proceed with the session. Over to you, Dr. Kumar Balani. Thank you, Sujani. This is a great uh, third day, and we look forward to the very interesting case presentations. And I'll uh, have Dr. Rajesh Arya introduce each speaker one by one. Let's begin, Dr. Rajesh Arya, with the first speaker. Thanks, Sujani, and uh, thank you, Dr. Belani. Uh, good morning, and probably good evening at your place. Uh, good morning, yes. Dr. Manisha. So we have got 11 speakers in this session, and these are the free papers. And uh, each speaker is given five minutes. There will be timer on the screen. After five minutes, there will be one minute of uh, one question from e any of the speakers, any of the chairpersons. And uh, the, the candidate has to answer within a minute. And then we'll go to the next speaker. And uh, we don't have any competitive uh, prize for this. Uh, this is to encourage the youngster to present papers in the, at the national and international level. So to begin with, we have uh, got uh, first speaker, Dr. Ashwini Malthumkar, and I request uh, Dr. Ashwini to share her screen and uh, present her paper. Uh, Medinic people, can you put the timer on the screen, please? Yes, Dr. Ashwini. Thank you, Dr. Ashwini. Yes, Dr. Ashwini. My screen is visible, sir. Yes, it's Correct. visible and you're audible. Please uh, start. Uh, good morning, sir. I'm Dr. Ashwini. I'm presenting today. I'm presenting to TGA Physiology Clinical Case in which a post-intervention procedure, transthoracic echocardiography, has altered the treatment plan. So next slide. I'll just click on the screen now. Uh, uh, a 50-day-old weight uh, baby weighing a weight of 4 kg presented with the poor feeding, baseline saturation 62%, bilateral lungs, normal vesicular breath sound, chest X-ray suggestive of increased pulmonary blood flow. So, transthoracic echocardiography has done, which showed dilated right-sided ventricle, compressing the left-sided ventricle. Left-sided ventricle uh, posterior wall thickness is less than 4 mm. Uh, which uh, showed the both great vessels are parallel to each other. So it was as considered as an atrioventricular concurrence and ventricular arterial disconcurrence. Diagnosis is made as transposition of great arteries with intact ventricular septum, regressed to left ventricle, poor mixing. 
the treatment options were for this patient were sending procedure or arterial switch operation with ecmo post op or lv draining with a pa banding plus bt shunt followed with arterial switch operation or lv draining with the pds stenting followed by arterial switch operation so we have considered for this baby pds stenting baby underwent a pds stenting for lv draining and planned for aso later this is a pds stenting cath club picture post pda baby saturation is increased to 92% initially but after 24 hours saturation dropped to 78% baby required high inotropes persistent lactic levels and first extubation failure after 72 hours this is a post pda stenting chest x ray showing uh, a pulmonary congestion so we considered to do transthoracic echocardiography to differentiate the possible causes that is ast not adequate increased or differential pda shunt flow or usual course of lv training bed transthoracic echocardiography has done uh, which shows the increased pulmonary blood flow but surprisingly smooth wall dilated right ventricle with morphological left which is considered as a morphological left ventricle left sided ventricle is septophilic with a septal caudal attachment and it is a morphological right ventricle so diagnosis is revised as atrioventricular discordance ventricular arterial concurrence that is isolated ventricular inversion so patient immediately emergence underwent emergency pda stent removal with pda ligation with the sending procedure post sending transthoracic echocardiography is shown where the pulmonary venous blood is directed towards the aorta and systemic blood is diverted towards the svc where post sending x ray and pulmon chest x ray showing uh, increased uh, decreased condition but child extubated on the post operative day 2 and discharge on post operative day 8 so conclu uh, isolated ventricular inversion is a very rare entity the child with isolated ventricular inversion have tg physiology usually associated with a vsd or atrial isomerism the dilated or displaced ventricular chambers make the morphological identification difficult to conclude my study the segmental morphological identification of cardiac chambers can be difficult but it is essential before any intervention in the congenital heart disease so there is no conflicts of interest or financial interest for this presentation uh, thank you dr ashwini uh, may I request dr manjusha to ask a question to dr ashwini uh, so uh, dr ashwini that's, that's a very nice presentation Uh, how does uh, uh, isolated ventricular inversion differ from congenitally corrected tga ma'am it is double uh, discordance ma'am where the atrioventricular discordance with the ventricular arterial discordance ma'am so okay. here only ventricular arterial uh, arterial ventricular discordance but uh, ventricular arterial concurrence ma'am so uh, Uh, it's very uncommon to be missed uh, by a pre-op echo, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it can happen uh, once in a while. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, Doctor Belani, sir. Yeah, I was just wondering. You could have. Why didn't you all do the sending in the first instance rather than two operations for this baby? The baby's uh, LV to train the LV, sir. Baby is very pre uh, low weight and small, so for LV training we have done PDS sending initially. Later on sending we have planned sending or atrial switch operation. So because we thought it as a, a DTG previously. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Doctor Ashwini. Uh, you may unshare the screen and. Uh, um, now i request the next speaker dr kedar bengal to share the screen and present his case uh, doctor i'll just message you dr kedar is uh, i think not reachable at the moment not able to okay uh, we'll wait speaker. for him uh, at the end now sure. i request dr jagdish a to present his case and uh, share his screen yes uh, sir uh, Uh, good morning everyone sir my screen is shared sir uh, yeah you are audible and your screen is visible to all yes sir uh, 
I am going to today going to present about significance of imaging inferior vena cava with the transverse visual echocardiography for surgical decision making and managing the hemodynamics. Uh, regarding the first case, uh, regarding the surgical decision making, is a case of stage four renal cell carcinoma. Sir, he is a 52 year old gentleman. He was uh, referred from outside the hospital, uh, diagnosed with a renal cell carcinoma of right kidney with the IBC thrombus. On evaluation for a maturity of two months duration, uh, he was diagnosed with a right renal cell carcinoma with IVC thrombus stage four, thrombus extending into the supradiaphragmatic supradiaphragmatic IVC or to the right atrium. This is a pre-op diagnosis. Uh, in this pre-operative CT imaging, we can clearly see the thrombus extending into the right atrium, which is arising from the right kidney and extending in the IVC and extending into the right atrium. In PACS, it was actually seen very clearly. Um, and wise, it was a laparotomy followed by sternotomy for tumor extraction from the right atrium. But uh, in the pre procedure, uh, TE of IVC uh, showing that tumor is not extending into the right atrium. Here we can see IVC tumor is located in the IVC only. This is the eustachian wall. We can clearly see it is confined to the IVC, not extending beyond the eustachian wall. And this is a TE loop, uh, which was confirming the tumor was confined to the IVC. So after uh, using TE, uh, we have actually patient underwent only laparotomy for tumor extraction plus nephrectomy, thus avoiding sternotomy, since TE shows tumor is not extending into the right atrium. Uh, this is the post-tumor removal of TE patient of the patient showing the patent inferior vena cover. And this is a color flow Doppler across the inferior vena cover showing patent IVC, post tumor removal. So IVC invasion associated with the uh, paraneoplastic has been reported up to 10% of renal cell carcinoma of patients. So, so intraoperative TE aids in uh, determining the proximal extension of the thrombus and it also guides the at level with which we need to cross clamp the IVC for extracting the tumor. And it also allows for intraoperative monitoring of cardiac physiology. For example, if in case any embolus, I mean IVC tumor is being embolus, we can able to easily identify the uh, pulmonary uh, thromboembolism easily using TE. Uh, coming to second case, is a case of is a 18 year old male, a case of tricuspid atresia with a ventricular septal defect with uh, pulmonary stenosis and loss eustachian one small PDA. Status post BDG plus atrial septectomy plus eustachian wall uh, excision plus PDA division with good bioindicular function. Uh, actually, patient was posted for completion contents. So, intraoperatively, while dividing the upper end of the sternum, there was injury to the left innominate vein, which resulted in massive bleeding. So, uh, volume resuscitation was done using IVC diameter as a surrogate marker. Uh, this is the actually baseline. TE image showing the baseline IVC diameter of the patient is 2.76 centimeter. And during bleeding, the IVC diameter decreased, actually decreased from 2.76 to 1 centimeter. And this TE image, we can see the collapsed IVC. And uh, here we can see the post resuscitation IVC diameter, the doctor resuscitation IVC diameter came, came back to normal size. So, uh, imaging IVC, uh, uh, I mean, hypolemic patients, patients can be easily identified using the measurement of the IVC, uh, measurement of the size and collapsibility of the IVC. So, greater than any greater than 50% collapse from the baseline diameter of IVC suggests the patient is hypolemic. So, coming to specific indications for imaging IVC. Uh, measuring IVC diameter may prove to be useful in redo surgeries where significant bleeding is expected. And in case of hemodynamic assessment of right atrial pressure, that is, uh, uh, we can uh, measure CVP also. And assessing the severity of TR and abnormal right ventricular filling patterns and uh, renal cell carcinoma extending to the IVC, and especially for at, at which level we need to cross clamp the IVC for tumor removal. So, conclusion, I presented two cases of aging IVC by TEE, which helped in patient management by avoiding stenotomy and directing the volume resuscitation of the patient. Resolve my references. 
thank you uh, thank you dr jagdish uh, it was nice uh, presentation of two cases uh, giving the importance of the assessment of ivc if i ask yes. you one question uh, what is the yes. most important thing of ivc by looking just putting a probe on the skin and looking at the ivc you can rule out one of a cardiac emergency uh, sir we can rule out the hypolemic cardiac arrest in case of emergency we can rule the we can rule out that hypolemia is not of the cause for cardiac i mean emergency sir uh, i would i would suggest you if uh, the my my answer would have been if you see the ivc is collapsing you can rule out tamponade Tem yes. that's a that's a caveat in uh, tamponade if you can see the ivc is collapsing uh, it's uh, pulsating and collapsing the tamponade is not there definitely uh, dr manisha yeah in the first case uh, you should have uh, uh, shown us the images of the pulmonary artery because i think uh, what was seen on ct uh, as a mass extending uh, into ra might have embolized into the pulmonary arteries yes ma'am uh, we are monitoring ma'am uh, during the procedure but i didn't put in the images oh, okay. but the patient intubated didn't all of any embolism uh, you so those images out. Those images were pre-op or were they intra-op for the in the atrium that you saw the CT scan? Uh, that is pre-operative, so pre-op before TE. So that images in CT, they have reported that tumor is extending into the right atrium. So clearly, if you okay. Do thank TD, you, Doctor. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Doctor Jagdish. Uh, now yes. I invite uh, next speaker, Doctor Shekhar Suman, to present uh, the case and uh, share the screen. Doctor Jagdish, you can. Uh, uh i mean uh, switch off i am audible sir yeah you yes. are audible your screen is visible please start good morning everyone i am very thankful to yakta for giving the opportunity to present on this platform So I'm presenting an interesting case of post CTP isolated anterior wall hypokinesia. So my patient was a 62 year old female with uh, chief complaint of dyspnea on exertion with recent progression of symptoms. Transthoracic echocardiography revealed severe calcific aortic stenosis with mild to moderate AR with concentric left ventricular hypertrophy with EF of 46 percent. Angiography revealed severe stenosis of the right coronary artery. So she was planned to undergo aortic valve replacement with venous graft to the right coronary artery so intraoperative patient was monitored according to the asa guidelines post induction 3d t probe was inserted intraoperative events so this is the mesophageal aortic or long axis view so in calcified aortic wall this is a 3d zoom view of the aortic wall in short axis so in restricted movement of the right coronary cusp with calcium deposition on the right and the left coronary cusp we signify severely calcified Aortic and degenerative aortic valve disease. So this is a, a major official uh, aortic valve long axis and the short axis view. We can see that there is mild to moderate AR with trivial MR. This is a transgastric mid-papillary short axis view. There is good systolic excursion of the endocardial borders with concentric left, left ventricular hypertrophy. This is a mid-official aortic valve long axis view with atheroma seated near the sinotubular junction, signifying severe atheromatous disease. This is a 3D zoom cropped image of the aortic wall in long axis with multi-bit acquisition. We can appreciate that there is a trauma seated near the left coronary artery orifice with the degenerated aortic wall. Similarly, this is a 3D zoom cropped image of the aortic wall in long axis, but there is absence of any trauma near the right coronary artery orifice. So the patient was heparinized. Uh, we went on CPB. a bioprosthetic valve was implanted in aortic position rca was grafted autotomy was closed with bovine pericardial patch augmentation patient was then rewarmed proximal anastomosis was done on further rewarming there was episode of severe hypotension so we supported this heart on cpb for 30 minutes further uh, rewarming there was again severe hypotension episodes of ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation which uh, reverted with dc shock on doing te imaging what we found that there was Uh, isolated hypokinesia of the anteroceptral anterolateral and the anterior wall there was increased severity of the mr but there was normal rv function and the normal bioprosthetic function 
So what could be the possible causes? These were our differentials. So can it be chronic AF leading to the embolization of thrombus, but there was no history of AF? Can it be ineffective myocardial preservation, but the heart arrested with single dose of cardioplegia without any LV distension or ECG changes? Can it be paradoxical embolism through PFO, but there was no history of the PFO? There was no history of the fibrillastrum or cortical either. So the most probable cause could be an embolizing atheroma. Now the right side was already grafted. So the most probable cause could be the atheroma embolizing to the left coronary system. So again, we did 3D imaging and what we found that the atheroma which was initially present near the left coronary artery orifice was now missing. So this confirmed our suspicion. This is a transgastric mid pebble short axis view. We can appreciate that there is isolated hypokinesia of the anterolateral, anteroceptal and the anterior wall. This is a two chamber view with colored Doppler showing increased severity of the MR. This is the mediocephal optical short axis view with X plane with color Doppler showing normal bioprosthetic function with no intravalvular or the paravalvular leak. So this is a 3D zoom view of uh, cropped image of optical in wrong axis with multi-bit acquisition. We can clearly appreciate that the atheroma which was initially present near the left coronary artery ostium was now missing. So this confirmed our suspicion that this atheroma might have embolized to the left coronary ostium causing isolated anterior wall hypokinesia. So we went back on CPV, grafted the LED, electively supported heart for a few minutes, then we slowly rewarm. Now there was decrease in the severity of MR, there was normal anterior wall motion. So we weaned off the patient with minimal supports. So this is the transgastric mid papillary short axis view with X plane. We can clearly appreciate now there was fairly good movement of the anterior wall. This is a medicine which is what called long axis with color compare. They were normal prosthetic function with trivial MR. So in conclusion, whenever we come across a preoperative significant atheromatic disease, a comprehensive PE examination post CPV should be done to rule out the embolization of atheroma. In our case, 3D PE significantly changed the surgical management of the patient, reduce morbidity and mortality. There is no ethical clearance requires. This is our original call. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shekhar. A nice case and a probably uh, difficult to diagnose. And uh, you people are lucky and uh, good enough that you could diagnose the tetheroma and uh, thought of the possibility. Uh, for, uh, first comment is that uh, you, uh, in all your views of a long axis, you said it's an aortic wall long axis, but the angle was 135 degrees. So probably we should call it a LV long axis. The aortic wall long axis is around 110, 120 degrees. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Uh, and uh, my comment is a uh, patient with aortic stenosis and you find out atheroma near the ostial origin of left uh, coronary ostia yes, uh, with, with the coronary artery disease, with the right coronary artery also stenos, yes, didn't you suggest the surgeons or uh, the idea of retrograde cardioplegia rather than anti-grade? Yes, we suggest it, but in our institute, uh, uh, usually they will go for ostial cardioplegia, sir. Uh, so they, they went for ostial cardioplegia, not by normal cardioplegia, by, by putting cannula. They opened the aorta and put the cardioplegia directly into the aorta. Yes, sir. And the ostia. Yes, sir. So if they're putting the cardioplegia directly into the ostia, I mean, moment they put the cross clamp and uh, open the aorta and put the cardioplegia, then the chances of atheroma going into the coronary is reduced because it's in front of you. You can see how your cardioplegia is going, probably. Uh, Dr. Manisha, ma'am, please. Yeah, I have two comments. So number one, I think you were very lucky to get away with this embolus going into the coronary artery. What if it had gone to the brain, which is atheromas in the aorta are have devastating implications yes, neurologically. Yes. So every uh, aorta where you have suspicion of uh, atheroma, you should go for an epiotic scan. Yes. Yes. And here the surgeon opened the aorta, he could have removed the atheroma because that is how it is managed. And then you can pinpoint even the site of proximal uh, aortic cross, cross clamping. Yes. So epi aortic scanning should be done wherever there's suspicion. Yes. I think so. I was so. gonna say, I was gonna say the same thing. That should be a standard protocol at your place. Uh, are you all not doing that? Yeah, we suggested them to uh, and cannulate uh, far distally, but uh, we could not do epicardial uh, ultrasound, that situation. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Shekhar. Now, please uh, you, switch, on your, switch off your video and uh, I request the next speaker, Dr. Varsha A.V. to share the screen and present the case. Hello, good morning. <clears throat> Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Uh, good morning, everybody. Today I'm going to present intraoperative critical hemodynamic management using transesophageal echocardiography, a report of two cases. Now, TE is a semi-invasive tool that allows an etiological diagnosis of hemodynamic instability intraoperatively and also in therapeutic guidance. Report, two cases where echocardiography helped to guide in the management of critical hemodynamics in, in an infant and an adult. Uh, case report one, there was a two-month-old child who presented with complaints of cyanosis and difficulty in feeding for one month duration. Transthoracic echocardiography showed uh, the child had a uh, transposition of great artery with side-by-side -side anatomy, toxic big anomaly an eight millimeter by uh, subpulmonic VSD with bidirectional shunt, a restrictive ASD, and a retropulmonary circumflex artery with severe pulmonary artery hypertension. The child was posted for arterial switch operation and a VSD patch closure. Standard ASA monitors were used and invasive lines put under general anesthesia using sevoflurin, fentanyl, midazolam, and pancuronium. Child was intubated with a 3.5 microcraft endotracheal tube and uh, surgery was done under cardiopulmonary bypass. We came off cardiopulmonary bypass in sinus rhythm on mildrenone, 0.5 microgram per kg per minute. Epicardio uh, epicardial echocardiography showed there was a dilated RA-RV with reduced RV contractility, severe TR, and a right ventricular systolic pressure of 124 millimeter mercury plus RA. Here, the uh, epicardial echocardiography shows a dilated RA-RV with reduced RV contractility and a severe TR. And this shows the TR uh, max PG of 124 millimeter mercury, indicating a right ventricular systolic pressure of 124 plus RA. So we decided to give a seldenafil bolus and uh, the effect was monitored using epicardial echocardiography. Post seldenafil uh, uh, bolus, epicardial echocardiography showed an improved RV contractility, a reduced TR and uh, uh, reduce systemic uh, right ventricular systolic pressures. The child was shifted to ICU on mildrenone and sildenafil infusion. Here, the epicardial echo shows that the TR has come down, RV contractility has improved, and right ventricular systolic pressures are 14 plus RA. Case two, a 66 year old gentleman was posted for uh, who was post PCI to LAD and OM, and an AICD inserted one year back. Complaint of chest pain and fun uh, functional class 3 dyspnea on exertion. Angiogram showed re stenosis of the LAD and OM stem and total occlusion of proximum R proximal RCA. Transesophageal echocardiography indicated LV dysfunction with regional wall motion abnormality and the EF of 27%. He was posted for CABG with six graphs. Standard ASA monitors were used and invasive arterial line placed. Induction was done using medazolam, fentanyl, propofol, and pancuronium, and intubated using 8.5 uh, cuffed endotracheal tube. Uh, induction and intubation were uneventful. A right IJV triple lumen and a left femoral arterial line were secured. Uh, pre cardiopulmonary bypass, the transesophageal echocardiography indicated severe LV dysfunction with an EF of 27% and a cardiac output of 2.4 liter per minute and a restrictive LV diastolic function. There was akinesia of, of the apex and segments and severe hypokinesia of the basal and mid segments. Here, the, uh, this shows the diastolic function, that is, the E by A was 2.6, indicating a severe restricted uh, uh, diastolic function and a pulmonary venous Doppler showing a uh, reduction of the S by D. CABG uh, with six graphs, that is lima to LAD, right venous, cephinous venous graph to diagonal, major uh, terminal OM, uh, RAMUS, and the RPDA was done. Cardiopulmonary bypass time was one hour, 15 minutes, and the cross clamp time of 43 minutes. We came up cardiopulmonary bypass on adrenaline, 0 0.05 mic per kg per minute, and noradrenaline, 0 0.05 mic per kg per minute. And a bolus of mildrenone, 500 microgram was given over 10 minutes, low IV push, and 
infusion was started at 0.5 microgram per kg per minute. In CPB, the TEE uh, showed an improved EF of 35%. Regional wall uh, motion abnormality had improved in the basal and the mid regions, and the LV diastolic function and cardiac ad output had improved. Here, it shows the post melanone bolus improvement in the diastolic function, where it has changed from the restrictive physiology with the E by A of more than 2.6 uh, to a uh, 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 here it shows an impaired uh, uh, relaxation and the uh, has improved. And the cardiac output has improved to three liters per minute. Now, a complete examination of a left and right ventricular size, function, and valvular function is essential in intraoperatively. And TE has shown to be the single most guiding, important guiding factor uh, in uh, management of 17 to 23 percent of the hemodynamic interventions intraoperatively. Also, TE has shown to alter medical therapy in 53% of the cases intraoperatively. Intraoperative TE is not only uh, useful uh, in, format, uh, form, uh, in formulating the surgical strategy and immediate assessment of the surgical outcome, but is also in, uh, useful in uh, making important decisions in the critical hemodynamic interventions and to improve patient outcome. These are my references. I have no financial disclosure or conflict of interest. Thank you, Dr. Varsha. Uh, first, I would say that uh, uh, are your surgeons not comfortable with the beating heart surgery? Because a poor LV and uh, pump, pump complications, uh, uh, normally the surgeons prefer a beating heart so that uh, they can finish their job easily and quickly. And second, uh, if the surgeons are uh, really even much more better, like in our institute, we do complete total arterial vascularization so that... Uh, I mean, uh, the, the necessary vessels get the arterial grafts. Uh, second thing uh, why I want to ask you, what advantage TE gave you in this case? Because what, whatever improvement you can see by hemodynamics as well, the, the pressures and everything must have increased and uh, heart rate must have settled down. Uh, what what uh, echocardiography, how it changed the therapy, or how it changed the management of the patient? With the TE, we could, uh, in the first case, uh, we saw that there was severe RV dysfunction. So we had decided to give a Silden apple bolus and we could see on TE, uh, the epicardial echo, the uh, improvement in the RV function and the reduction in TE. So our decision was correct. So uh, it's in the second to, case, in the second case, uh, uh, patient had diastolic function, dysfunction, severe restrictive diastolic function. So on TE, we have seen how uh, Mildenone bolus, normally we uh, don't go ahead with the Mildenone bolus because of the uh, hypotension it causes. Uh, uh, so we, uh, we usually start with the infusion alone, but here the patient had a severe restrictive uh, impaired, uh, I mean, restrictive uh, diastolic function. So we decided to give a bolus and uh, it was uh, shown to help. And uh, it had changed from grade three to grade one diastolic dysfunction. So it, uh, it also, it's a little, uh, little uh, I mean, uh, our, uh, difficult to digest for me. Uh, that uh, if the diastolic dysfunction is there, you give a bolus and otherwise not. Well, uh, Dr. Manisha, please. Uh, I think that all C coronary artery disease patients would have pre-existing diastolic dysfunction, which uh, you should have measured in the as baseline preoperatively. And all patients coming off cardiopulmonary bypass would also show diastolic dysfunction, which is normal, you know? So to say that it happened in the post-operative period, though you have addressed a very important problem, but unless we know the baseline parameters, we can't say that it was not pre-existent. No, ma'am. In this case, pre-operative, uh, uh, he had uh, restrictive diastolic dysfunction. So uh, while coming off, we decided to give a bolus and see if it had improved. Did it get worse after coming off? Were you no, ma'am. Uh, it was initially grade three, which had uh, after the bolus, and we came off and we saw the TE, it was showing a grade one. So, but these readings are all intra. Intraoperatively. One more question. What was the cause of the pulmonary hypertension in that baby? Did you figure out? I know you treated it with the drugs, but did you figure out why the baby got pulmonary hypertension? Neonates, sir, so uh, uh, definitely he will be having a, a, a pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Uh, PA that pressures would be before, high. it was there only afterwards. Thank you, sir. So a child was uh, having PH also uh, pre op, sir. Hmm. Okay, just, just, okay. 
just a last comment. Did you start amiodarone in this patient with a, such a poor L, LV function? Yes. Just to know your protocol. Yes, no. no. Okay. I uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Varsha. Nice presentation of two cases, starting from a young uh, uh, boy to the elderly patient. You have completed the entire range of uh, age of patients. Uh, thank you. You can uh, switch off your video. And uh, now I request uh, Dr. Rashna Vadva to share the screen and present the case. Thank you, Dr. Varsha. Uh, Good morning, sir. Sir, I can't share my screen. It has been blocked by the host. It is written. Um, can somebody from Madrid can help her? Or shall we Jordan, wait? Jordan, can you give her permission to share? Uh, Dr. Rashna, can you try it again right now? Or, or we'll wait uh, for some time and invite next speaker? i just try, sir. Yes, please. Yeah, you can. There you go. Go to the presentation mode. Slideshow mode in the bottom of the screen. Yeah. Yes. Start now. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I would like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to present on this virtual platform. So I straight away begin with the case of, uh, this was a case of TGA. And we had a two-year-old male child weighing 12 kgs. And uh, uh, the trans thoracic echo showed unprepared LV. So this child was prepared for Senning's procedure. So this is, this is my first view. And this was a deep... Uh, deep transgastric uh, long axis view uh, where I can see the <clears throat> iota arising from RV and uh, PA arising from LV and bifurcating into uh, RPA and LPA. So TE was uh, utilized uh, pre uh, in the pre bypass period to diagnose the findings of trans thoracic echo. And this is a mid-esophageal four-chamber view. And there was a color Doppler showing uh, OSASD with left to right shunt. And the RV is markedly dilated. The interventricular septum is shifted towards the left. And the LV is very small and looks banana-shaped con configuration, uh, which is like a marker of unprepared LV and unsuitable for ASO. So this child has a, uh, had a ASD where there was mixing of blood. So this was uh, the video, mid esophageal four chamber view and uh, color Doppler uh, showing the uh, shunt, the left right shunt and uh, RV is markedly dilated. And uh, we can see the interventricular septum uh, shifting towards uh, left. So this was a transgastric short axis view showing both the ventricles. The RV is uh, hypertrophic, markedly dilated, interventricular septum shifted here. And uh, the LV is typically banana shaped. And uh, after this, we also calculated the left ventricular mass that also confirmed the findings of uh, unprepared uh, LV. So this was another uh, video. And it also shows the imaging uh, of both ventricles. Though the ventricular function was uh, good, uh, the LV was contracting well, all the walls, whereas RV was hypertrophic and markedly dilated. So after the, we, uh, the standard techniques of general anesthesia were used, the patient went on cardiopulmonary bypass and the buffers were created. And uh, this was uh, the intro finding once we were coming off bypass. And this shows the SV baffle and the, uh, the systemic baffle and the pulmonary venous baffle. So 
So the intra-transesophageal uh, echocardiography, it confirmed the diagnosis of the TGA by delineating ventricular arterial discordance, and we could see, uh, see both the parallel uh, circulations. And RV was markedly dilated, the LV was small, d shaped and left ventricular mass was calculated using this formula of 0.18 uh, multiplied by, we had, uh, there was a big bracket, 1.04 uh, with the calculation of intraventricular septal diameter, left ventricular and diastolic diameter, and posterior wall thickness diameter. It was Q. This was Q minus LVDD Q. And uh, after multiplying this with 1.04 and finally 0.6 grams uh, added to calculate this. And most of the parameters, they were like suggestive of unprepared and involuted LV. That is why we could not go for ASO and we had planned uh, sendings. So this is the video once we came off and uh, color doctor of mid-esophageal four chamber view. 2D echo image showing the Senex procedure and depicts the pulmonary venous baffle. We can see the pulmonary venous baffle. Uh, directing uh, this uh, 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 oxygenated blood into RV and through the aorta. And uh, this is uh, the other uh, for the pulmonary flow into the LV. So uh, just coming to a uh, short review of literature, what we mean by TGA and uh, the presentation is generally variant have patients may have... Uh, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Rishna, you have uh, overshoot the time and you can skip this uh, review and okay, come to sir. the conclusion, please. Uh, so, uh, though yes. ASO is a technique of choice, but because of this unprepared LV, uh, the settings and all were done. And uh, the post-op, yes, the TE was very helpful in tearing of cardiac chambers and showed the biventricular functions and the PV and SV baffles. Generally in small, in this pediatric age group, where we fail is having assessing the biventricular functions and assessing and guiding the flood fluid and the drug therapy. So TE was very helpful because uh, just before this case, uh, we lost one case of ASO where we could not come off and the, <clears throat> the coronaries were not, there was some issue with coronaries and while coming off, the heart uh, turned blue all the way, uh, again and again. So in this case, we could do all and uh, the child I think uh, Dr. Rishna, you, you need to come to the conclusion slide right now. Uh, Please so come I've to the conclusion slide. So the T was helpful in guiding. So that was conclusion only in this. Uh, and uh, we could guide the fluid and the therapy and the, the patient was extubated okay. well. And uh, uh, Dr. So, Manisha, ma'am, please. I think uh, they were beautiful images. And uh, uh, so you would tell me what kind of PE probe were you using? Was it a mini multiplane? Yes, ma'am. It, it is a pediatric probe. We have GE healthcare machine and we can use it. And uh, this was the advantages uh, that we got with this new machine. Though we don't have 3D at present, but we have this pediatric probe. Otherwise, we were oh. always looking for FP or FP. Uh, yes, ma'am. There are three kinds of pediatric probes. Yes, ma'am. Depending, uh, and the selection of PE probe is based on the uh, weight of the baby. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so that's why, was it a mini multiplane or was it a uh, biplane or just... Pediatric, a... pediatric biplane. Okay. Yes, Kumar Belani, sir. Yeah, so what, what's your plan for this baby? When will you bring him back for, for a corrective surgery? So I don't think now this child will be able to go for a corrective surgery for the uh, just because after these baffle cre creations, if if the if suppose the surgery took place early means if it is like in one month of age, the LV uh, is can be prepared can be tamed and even if till one year of age, LV can be with pedial ligation and with having two stages surgery. But after like two years having with OS, ASDs and uh, unprepared LV, it is very difficult to have that LV mass. Okay. So uh, ASO uh, was not a plan. Uh, yes, sir. A few suggestions on your pre presentations. Uh, yes, there was sir. no ECG in any of the loops. Sir, I agree. Okay. Just because second there was thing, issue, I actually agree. Second, second yeah. thing, you have not worked very well on the nobology. Your depth was very disturbed. Half of the lower part of the screen was blank. 
you should have decreased the depth and uh, again all the knobs uh, you need to set before you start recording this probably okay. this suggestion will help you in future to present the cases and thank you so much cases. sir i am i have uh, just okay. started otherwise the nice, nice case thank you thank you so much you may unshare thank your uh, yes. screen and uh, video now i request our next speaker dr suman keshav uh, to share the screen and present the case Dr. Suman Keshav, please unmute yourself, share your screen. Unmute yourself. Yeah, we could see, but... Uh, hello. Yeah, yes, we can sir. hear you. Now you share your screen and start your case. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Am I uh, audible? You are audible. Your screen is visible. Please start. Yes, sir. Uh, good, good morning to everyone present here. It's a pleasure to be presenting on this virtual platform. I'll be presenting a case report uh, for a TA PVC case that was done in our institute. Total anomalous uh, pulmonary venous communication is a rare congenital cardiac defect, which accounts for about 1.5 to 3% of all congenital heart diseases where the total pulmonary venous blood drains directly into the right side of the heart or the systemic veins. There are four types described, uh, supracardiac, which is 48% and one of the most common uh, types, followed by cardiac and infracardiac and mixed, which is only about 10% of the cases. Manifestation of TAPVC is uh, highly variable, where it can present with either an obstructed uh, pulmonary venous flow, which shows us low cardiac output uh, syndrome, hypoxemia, or metabolic acidosis. These cases have high rates of mortality and morbidity, whereas unobstructed TAPVC can have a right ventricular volume overload and present with congestive heart failure and pulmonary artery hypertension. In extreme end of the uh, cases, obstructed TAPVC may also require pre-op inotropes, ventilatory support, or ECMO. And in uh, right ventricular overload patients where there is pulmonary artery hypertension, they may need pulmonary vasodilators, including inhaled nitric oxide, uh, preoperatively itself. So anesthetic management in these cases cannot be, cannot be presumptive and we have to individualize for each patient. Yeah. So we uh, conducted a case of a 22-year-old uh, male, an adult patient who had come to us in the preoperative period with history of chest pain and an, a, uh, an episode of uh, cyanosis with bluish discoloration of fingertips uh, with uh, cy central cyanosis basically. And preoperatively, a transthoracic echo was done, which showed that the patient had supracardiac TAPVC along with ostium secundum ASD and severe pulmonary artery hypertension. So we uh, induced this case with balanced opioid anesthesia with the standard ASA monitoring. And TEE probe, uh, which was a pediatric TEE probe, uh, was inserted so that we do not obstruct the pulmonary uh, venous uh, confluence. And this image shows the vertical vein, which was draining into the left innominate vein. And we traced the pulmonary vein. Yes. Yeah. So this was the vertical vein, uh, which we diagnosed in the mid-esophageal right pulmonary venous uh, view, where we can further trace the vertical vein draining into the left innominate vein. And further, as we see, it is draining into the SVC which was uh, in itself dilated. So this was the vertical vein, which was uh, draining into the SVC. So again, uh, this was just the picture where we could uh, trace the entire vertical vein uh, going beyond uh, posterior to the uh, LA and coming into the SVC. Uh, a supracardiac TAPVC with a common chamber was identified in this case, where the superior vena cava had a size of 26.9 mm. Also, an OS ASD was uh, detected with a right to left shunt. And since this was an unobstructed TAPVC, there was dilated RA as well as uh, right ventricle. The left atrium was only 2.4 centimeters, with the left ventricular internal diameter in diastole being 4.4 and in systole 2.4 centimeters. 
the left ejection fraction calculated was 60 percent intraoperatively once the re was uh, opened we could see the pulmonary vein opening into the uh, right atrium as well as the asd which was uh, an ostium secundum type of asd and uh, again when we see this the svc is very much uh, dilated because of uh, the right ventricular volume overload and uh, we can again in this view also see that the uh, vertical vein is draining into the svc Again, we also uh, saw the effect of, uh, we saw the function of the right ventricle where in this two uh, the four chamber uh, view, because it's a pediatric probe, we could not completely uh, see the four chambers. The right ventricle was uh, highly dilated with thinning of the right ventricular wall, as well as the interventricular septum had lost its convexity and had become straight, suggesting again, highly dilated RV. Uh, though uh, the LV had good contractility, the RV ejection fraction that was calculated came out to be 45%. In the modified bicable view also, uh, we could uh, assess the uh, vertical vein, which was draining at the junction of the SVC to RA. And a very highly dilated SVC can be noted in this view. We also applied a color Doppler to uh, see the flow of uh, blood flow into the RA through the vertical vein. And also in that view, we could assess uh, for the presence of TR, which was mild in this case. This was a 22-year-old male uh, who had uh, SPO to 87% on yeah. air. Dr. Suman, you need to uh, reach to the final diagnosis because you have overshoot the time already. Okay, so, uh, so basically in this patient, uh, we could assess the RV function uh, along with the assessment of pH. Indirectly, we could calculate PVR using our TE machine. And uh, based on that, during uh, when coming off pump, we could decide that an inodilator was needed for this patient with the dobutamine meldronone uh, that was added. We could come off pump quite easily. As well as in these patients having a... Uh, OS ASD, we could ensure that there was complete de-airing of the chambers of the heart before we close the heart to avoid post-operative uh, CNS injury to the patient. So TE helped us not only pre-operatively to confirm the diagnosis and to see the site of confluence which was coming in, to assess the right ventricular function. Also post-operatively, it helped us to see the adequacy of surgery, to assess biventricular function, as well as to see the SVC gradient post-operatively, uh, wherever this usually, which is important when a pulmonary vein drains into the RA SVC junction. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Suman. Uh, quick question by Dr. Manisha, ma'am. Um, well, did you, uh, you haven't shown the gradients, uh, any slides, Doppler views of a gradient across uh, SVC. Uh, yes, from that, uh, actually in that uh, bicable view, we could show that color Doppler, but yeah, we did not uh, take another view. We didn't uh, take the picture of the view that was uh, showing the green. Uh, and why did you take a picture of the screen, uh, you know? Yes, ma'am, uh, the uh, video taking is I'll improve. Uh, same comment from me. If you're if you uh, showing something which is interesting, you should prepare yourself. Uh, in a way that you can record it properly, good quality image, rather than taking a screen picture. Then yes. uh, by taking screen, screen picture, we, half of the screen is not, not visible where we see the settings where angle and we can assess which view you are watching. Yes. So I think uh, be, be a little more aggressive in uh, recording and uh, transferring the recording from the machine itself rather than the camera. Yes, sir. Kumar, sir. I have one comment. Uh, do you guys do CT angio for these cases? Because... A three-dimension CT angio will give you a good uh, uh, anatomy also. Uh, yes, sir. CT angiography was done for this patient, uh, which also told us that there was a, a T supracardiac TAPVC, which was raining into the RA. So when, you, then, knew, when you knew when you knew that the patient has got a, a third wind draining into the SVC, you should have been well prepared with the eco machine, with the ECG and everything, and could have recorded beautiful pictures of that. Thank you, Dr. Suman. Uh, now I invite the next speaker, Dr. Pranati Iranki, 
uh, to share the screen and present the case. Your screen is visible, uh, Pranati. You please start the case. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Pranati. I'm a cardiac anesthesia final year resident from Jayadeva Hospital. Today, I'm going to present a case uh, that is post operative retroaortic mass should be re explored or not. Coming to the case report, uh, this is a case of three month old 3.5 kg. Can you go to the, screen? You go to the uh, presentation mode? Full screen? Yes. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is a three month, 3.5 kg female child with obstructive supracardiac DAPVC was posted you did for not intracardiac. Click it, Prandati. Prandati, you did not click it. Please, please click to that uh, knob. I, I, I have, sir. Not happening now. Uh, now, sir. Okay, I'll continue like this. No, no issues. Proceed. The preoperative TTE showed all the four pulmonary veins which are joined to form a common chamber of 1.5 to 0.6 cm behind the LA and it was joining SVC at SVC RA junction where there was a mild turbulence and mild obstruction there and there was a stressed PFO shunting right to left, dilated RA and RV with RV dysfunction, moderate to severe TR with an RVSP of 80 and a hyperkinetic pH. Intraoperatively, the surgeon has anastomosed the common chamber, rerouted the common chamber to LA and the PFO was closed and the baby was weaned from CPP with supports of uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline at 0.1 microgram per kg per hour and lindrinone at 0.33 microgram per kg per hour. And the baby was shifted to post-operative surgical ICU and was electively ventilated for 24 hours. TT on POD0 was uh, uh, okay uh, with uh, my, uh, with RV dysfunction with mild TR and the flow across the anastomosis of common chamber into LA was laminar and there was no turbulence. But on uh, POD1, the transthoracic echo done by senior pediatric cardiologist revealed a homogeneous mass of 1.65.9 centimeters in retroaortic area and anterior to LA. The flows were uh, uh, of pulmonary vein into LA were laminar and there was no obstruction or gradient. The mass uh, they have suspected to be a thrombus. There was a slightly increased bleeding on POD0 and the mass was uh, near uh, to the anastomosis. So this has favored the conclusion of a thrombus. Uh, this is a video uh, uh, loop, TTE loop uh, showing apical four chamber view. Uh, this is the mass. Your, your screen is, uh, you, you need to unshare the screen and share again, please. Uh, the the uh, slides are now not moving further. Yeah, now now share it again. It's not happening. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Can you see, sir? Uh, go to full screen, screen mode. Screen. Yeah, go, to, go to full screen mode. Yeah, sir. Okay. Bottom no. right, bottom right, full screen. Yeah, I, I, actually, in my laptop, I'm able to see in full screen mode only, sir. Hmm. Uh, I think uh, you can set the things later, right, and we can go to the next presenter probably. Otherwise, without seeing the videos and loops and pictures, there is no meaning of uh, presentation. Uh, we'll we'll come back to you, uh, Dr. Pranati. May I request Dr. Anita Divakar. Uh, to to uh, share the penalty, you can unshare your screen right now. Switch off your computer and switch it again. We'll come back to you later. Okay, there's some some, uh, some snag in your system probably. Okay, Dr. Anita Divakar, please. Yeah, we can see your screen. Go to the full screen mode and start presentation. Anita, can you hear us? Yes, yes sir. Yes, so go to the full right screen point. mode and start immediately. Yes, I am not able to go to the full screen mode, sir. I'll present the continuation. All right, continue. Uh, good morning, all. I'll be presenting a case wherein we had aortic dissection post-operatively after, after the Bental surgery. This was a 33-year male patient who presented with dyspnea on exertion. He was an ex-smoker, not hypertensive. And uh, his preoperative echo showed a severe uh, aortic regurgitation. The tri it was a tricuspid aortic valve with dilated aortic root and ascending aortic aneurysm, which was also confirmed with the CT angio. His pre-op Doppler showed that carotids in the lower limbs were normal and he had a normal LV function. 
So this is a pre-op uh, transesophageal echo loops where you can see the tricuspid valve with severe aortic regurgitation. And this is uh, with the aortic valve long axis where we can see severe AR with the dilated aortic root. And this is the dilated LV, but the aortic valve is normal. And in this view, uh, we can see that uh, the descending aorta, which is normal, which was normal preoperatively. So this patient, uh, we uh, for anesthesia, uh, before prior anesthesia, we inserted a right radial artery and after induction, we placed a left femoral artery cannulation, was done. And he underwent a bental procedure wherein the aortic valve was replaced with the 27 uh, TTK valve and the ascending aorta and the root was replaced with a 32 size uh, polyester graft. Postoperatively, coming off was uh, not difficult and uh, the, there was uh, no uh, gradient. The gradient across the aortic valve was uh, 6 by 4 and there was no paravalvular leak and there was very mild LV dysfunction which for which we had a minimal inotropic support. In the, post -op, in the immediate post-operative period, we saw that the femoral artery pressure trace was found to be dampened, and we thought it was due to the malpositioning of the arterial catheter. But however, on inspection, there was uh, the, uh, the arterial cannula was in place. We also cross-checked with the ultrasound, which also was found to be in position. And then we noticed that both the lower limbs were cold and it was poorly perfused. Then we did a Doppler examination with the ultrasound, which showed very poor signals. So we thought probably there could be a thrombus or there could be possibility of the aortic dissection in, as this patient had aortopathy pre-existing. And we also did an ultrasound on the other uh, femoral artery, which we had a suspicion of di uh, dissection because there is separation of the intimal layer. So we did a TE in the ICU and we the, then we confirmed the aortic dissection and it was orig originating in the aortic arch. However, it did not involve the left subclavian artery. So this is the view where in the, this is the aortic arch long axis view where we can see the dissection flap there. And this is the short axis view of the arch where we can see that it is not involving the subclavian artery. This is the descending iota uh, where we can see the true lumen and the false lumen. So since there was malperfusion, that is the lower limbs were cold and clammy, and though the urine output had not significantly dropped at this point, however, the plan was to uh, stent this, uh, to put an endovascular stent to address the malperfusion. And uh, for this, we also used the TE to guide uh, the uh, to help in uh, detecting the guide wire in the true lumen and help the deployment of the stent. So in the cath lab, uh, TE was also placed and we deployed an endovascular stent after the distal pulses improved and angiography showed good renal perfusion also. So this is the TE which was done in the cath lab where we can see that this is a stent with the guide, uh, guide wire with the true lumen. And this is the cath lab uh, images where you can see that there is an endovascular stent which is placed and this image shows the good renal perfusion. Generally, the aortic dissection is mainly, uh, most commonly, it is due to the pre-existing causes of the iotopathy, which was also there in this patient. And it can also be caused due to acquired conditions like hypertension and other causes. And there is possibility of iatrogenic causes, especially uh, during aortic cannulation and during cardiac surgery in the presence of iotopathy. In this patient, uh, probably... It was a uh, spontaneous aortic dissection which occurred post-operatively and uh, because uh, pre-operatively we had uh, checked the descending iota, there was no uh, dissection. And uh, TTE is very accurate, as accurate as CT and MRI in terms of sensitivity and specificity. It can be easily used bedside, which makes uh, it ideal in a hemodynamically unstable patient. Our patient was hemodynamically stable, but it was a bedside which could immediately diagnose. And uh, when it is diagnosed, when it is a Stanford type A, it is generally a surgical emergency, which uh, has to be addressed immediately. Type B, usually intervention is required in complicated cases, like as in this case where there was malperfusion. So we conclude that in the background of a strong clinical suspicion, post-operative transesophageal echocardiography played a crucial role in the early diagnosis and subsequent management of this aortic arch dissection. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anita. It's a very tough, complicated, and uh, uh, draining the anesthetist uh, present in the ICU. Uh, I have got a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Uh, you are having the TE probe in, in, in the patient during the operations of uh, Bental, which you did. And yes, I sir. think you, you used a separate uh, valve and a separate ascending aorta graft, yes, sir. not a yes, composite sir. graft. Yes, sir. Before shifting, did you do, do the TE and there was no dissection? Sir, uh, before shifting, we did not see the descending iota, sir. I mean... Uh, yeah, that is one thing yes, probably sir. you missed. Yes, sir. 
If yes, you sir. Yes, you would sir. have seen this uh, yes, because sir. sometimes. Second thing, the, what was the cannulation, aortic cannulation site? Was it axillary or a femoral? Aortic cannulation was in the high arch, sir. High arch uh, um, uh, cannulation. Yes, was sir, because it over the, is... Was it over the wire or a direct cannulation? Direct cannulation, sir. Okay. Okay, because uh, if it is axillary, sometimes the wire can uh, dissect the descending aorta, which we had one case. And uh, intraoperatively, the urine output and everything was okay? Everything was fine, sir. So It was not got... during the cannulation, sir, because there was we didn't have any problems on pump. There was no acidosis also. Hmm. So we didn't have, probably it was post-operatively, sir. Okay. And Dr. Manisha, ma'am? Yeah, because I just, uh, you did show that image pre-operative of descending. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma I think it was just missed because uh, immediately coming off pump, you did not uh, visualize. We did not see the descending at a post yeah. operation. Yes, ma'am. Yes. No other comments. Huh? Two so, questions. Uh, one, one is uh, when you when the case was done, you said the limbs were not getting proper circulation, just in the immediate uh, in the operating room itself. In the no, sir, in the ICU, not in the OT. In the ICU, when mm -hmm. we shifted, we wanted to check the arterial position also, and that time we noticed that the peripheries were cold. The lower limbs. So it was it was up later in ICU because otherwise yes, you could have you could yes, have done sir. something. Now what what was the reason that he had this separation of the of the dice uh, you know aortic area? Why why did he do that in the post op period? The spontaneous aortic dissections in the presence of aortopathy is possible, sir. And uh, probably during decannulation also, if anything must have, if some injury must have occurred during decannulation and some reinforcement sutures which were taken. We do not know exactly. Either there are two possibilities. Either during decannulation there could have been an issue, or it it was a spontaneous dissection, which can is known to occur in these aortopathy patients. If the you, last question. New uh, preoperative. One, one more before. If the if this patient had dissection preoperatively and the aortic valve disease, could you have done aortic valve replacement and placed the stent without going into open heart surgery and done it transvascularly? Yes, it could have been done, sir. Uh, last, last, uh, small, uh, quick uh, reply from you. How did you manage the proximal pressures when they were inflating the balloon for stent placement, especially in presence of a uh, few hours before you had done a ventral? So the pressures we had kept the lower side only, sir. It was around 90s only, sir. Sometimes the right uh, radial artery we had. Yes, sir. Uh, sometimes people do do fibrillate, electively fibrillate so that they can uh, put uh, no, the balloon. Sir. We did not do that. We did not use the uh, fibrillation method, sir. We just kept the pressures on the lower side. That's it. Okay, and you manage it well after that. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Nice presentation, uh, Dr. Uh, Roja. And now I request Dr. Shikant to uh, share the screen and present the case. Good morning, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, you're audible. Your screen is visible. Please start. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm presenting a uh, Brusilla endocarditis patient uh, coming for uh, uh, AVR surgery. Uh, I'm unable to go to the next slide. I'm unable click on to the go screen. to the next slide, sir. There Just is click a on the screen. Click on the screen. On the screen or, or the... So go to the left button. You will find that uh, small, small buttons. You can click okay. on those buttons to go to the okay. next slide. Yeah, uh, brucellosis is a commonest genetic infection. Uh, brucellosis in India is very common but often neglected. Brucella endocarditis is a rare but uh, life threatening complication of brucellosis, uh, which predominantly involves aortic valve. Antibiotic treatment alone is not recommended. Valve replacement uh, is rec uh, recommended uh, uh, for eradicating brucella from the infected valves. So, coming to case presentation, a 51 year uh, old man, uh, Handman Aller, uh, uh, presented with fever and breathlessness for one week. History of antibiotic use for four months back for IgM positive for brucella. Uh, when, uh, when he admitted his uh, blood pressure 100 by 50, heart rate 98. On cardiac auscultation, uh, there is early diastolic decrescent of marma. On trans thoracic echo, large vegetation adherent to aortic valve causing severe AR with LVF 40% with the top seat 12. On chest X-ray, hilar congestion with cardio, cardiomegaly and ECG was normal. And uh, CRP and PCT are high, uh, so we suspected in, uh, infective endocarditis. And uh, WBC count 21,000. The patient uh, was an intermittent BiPAP due to failure. So in view of urgency in case of, uh, and known case of Brussels endocarditis, uh, patient was posted for uh, 
ABR uh, and the vegetation removal with the continuation of antibiotics and anesthesia management uh, with, uh, with the routine uh, uh, standard monitoring and uh, routine uh, induction we have done and then uh, uh, in a uh, transesophageal echo we have done and uh, we confirmed the preoperative findings and in, uh, in addition to that uh, we found uh, uh, we sh we have seen this uh, large vegetation uh, uh, 13 to 13 to 13 mm on uh, aortic valve which causing severe air additionally we found aortic root abscess with uh, damaging the aortic root uh, and the coronary astia uh, which even uh, which was uh, eventually required aortic root replacement with rca grafting along with aortic valve replacement so total cvp duration uh, 207 minutes and coagulopathy corrected with adequate uh, blood products due to moderate uh, lv and rv dysfunction uh, with the global hypokinesia of lv patient was started military infusion and the post operative management the patient uh, uh, chest closed next day and in view of severe RV dysfunction, uh, military infusion continued and extubated after 36 hours. Antibiotic safety action and macromycin continued for 30, day, 30 days uh, as per uh, uh, ID consultation. Uh, this is a aortic valve uh, short axis view showing uh, uh, I'll play video. Uh, you can see here uh, uh, right coronary cusp is damaged and uh, looks like uh, uh, here uh, uh, you can see uh, aortic root also uh, looks like damaged here. Yeah. So I'll go to next. This is aortic wall long axis view. You can see here uh, uh, right coronary cusp side uh, cusp is damaged and uh, looks like uh, there is abnormal uh, aortic root. And uh, this is a uh, uh, to see the LV function here. We added this echo and uh, one more echo video. You can see in this also, uh, right coronary cusp is damaged and looks like uh, aortic root a little abnormal here. And uh, here this echo image showing uh, uh, severe AR. And the post-op echo, uh, this patient had uh, uh, severe RV dysfunction post-op uh, with LVF 40%. And the conclusion, uh, patient with the Brussel endocarditis requires a meticulous uh, echocardiac evaluation. In this case, uh, trans echo uh, helped in diagnosis of aortic root abscess in coronary sinus area, which uh, changed the surgery plan from aortic valve replacement to aortic valve replacement with aortic root replacement with the right coronary artery grafting. And the, these are the references. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shikan. Uh, yes. Manisha, madam, you may ask, please. I can just, uh, I would like to comment on the images. Yes, ma'am. Uh, apart from uh, the ECG not being the, uh, there. Huh? Yeah, uh, ECG was normal, but I mentioned. I, I, I didn't keep ECG, but it showed normal. No, no, no. no you have normal. to keep the ECG. It's a, it's a okay. protocol, it's a guideline to keep ECG on the screen. ECG should be there. Okay, okay, ma'am. Next time I'll do that. Yeah, and uh, I think you have stretched them or, you know, the optimization of the image is uh, really not there. It could have been uh, much better. Okay, madam. Okay, next time I'll do that. Because it's a good case, you know, to you could delineate the abscess cavity and everything if you would have uh, adjusted uh, uh, the gain and compress, compression and all that. I think. Okay, madam. Yeah, next time I'll do that. Sure. Uh, two questions I have. One yes, is uh, why didn't uh, for the brucellosis, doxycycline and rifampine as the two antibiotics that are recommended for these patients for at least eight weeks. So it looks like you didn't use those two antibiotics. No, patient uh, uh, patient was uh, intubated, patient is on BiPAP, he couldn't take oral, so we started IV antibiotics. He's in failure. Uh, yeah. Afterwards, like before he went home, you could have given him those two. And the second thing is, uh, this. Uh, do they have any vaccine for this brucellosis so that farmers who are taking care of animals? Uh, actually, like in, in India, in India, a vaccine is not recommended as per guidelines for humans. Vaccine is uh, recommended for animals. Okay. Okay. Uh, we will go to the next presenter, and I request uh, Dr. Rosa Madhuri to share the screen and present the case, please.
Shall I start, sir? Yes, please. Am I audible? Your your audible screen is visible, please, sir. Okay. A warm good morning to everyone. Today I am presenting an interesting case of LV clot with the role of epicardial lipo in clot extraction. Coming to brief case history. A 23-year-old male patient, driver by occupation, admitted to current. Admitted with the coronary artery disease, which was diagnosed incidentally during evaluation of left knee ACL tear after falling from bicycle. He fell down from bicycle in December 2020. But in view of COVID, he took May two treatment, and in the month of March 2011, March 2021, he had fever and cough. Third, also he he took symptomatic treatment in view of lockdown. Then in the month of June, he came, he went to one private hospital where he was diagnosed as ACL tear with LV clot with positive COVID antibodies without RT-PCR positive report. Then coming to the other comorbidities or risk factors, he's a smoker, alcoholic, moderately built with a BMI of 27 kg per meter square, recently diagnosed uncontrolled diabetes mellitus is there. Next slide. Coming to the investigation, 2D echocardiogram showing a large clot in LV occupying more than 50% of LV cavity, abetting both mitral and aortic valves, measuring 6.7 into 2.9 centimeters with the left ventricular epico anterior, epico septal, epico lateral, epico interior, and epical valves, thinned out and echinetic segments. With global LV dysfunction with an EF of 35%. Cardiac MRI showed irregular elongated mobile intraluminal LV mass with LED territory infarct. Coronary angiogram showed normal. This, this is the ECG. In the ECG, interestingly, we had T wave inversions and uh, lead one and AVL with V1 and V2 Q waves. This is the microbiology report showing high uh, uh, COVID antibody titers of 5,479. Next slide. This is the parasternal long axis view showing the loop. Sir, can you play the loop? Parasternal long axis view showing the parasternal long axis view showing the thrombus. This is the parasternal short, short axis view at the metal wall level. In this, we can see the relationship of the LV thrombus with the metal wall reflex. Next slide. Next slide, sir. This is the apical five chamber view showing thrombus extending into the LVOT. Sir, can you play the loops? Uh, doctor, I think the videos have not come across in the slide when you sent it to me. Okay, okay, sir. The next slide, sir. Next slide. This is the apical five chamber view, four chamber view, so showing the thrombus extension from the LV apex to the LVOT in the longitudinal view. Clearly, we can see the thrombus extending from the LVOT into the LVOT, from the apex into the LVOT. Next slide, sir. This is the apical five chamber view with the continuous wave Doppler across the aortic valve, showing no significant obstruction across the aortic valve. Next slide, sir. Coming to the procedure, preoperatively patient was shifted to ICU and immobilized. In view of low EF, injection, uh, liver cement and infusion was started preoperatively prophylactically. Intraoperatively, transfer as echo was done to clearly delineate the borders and extent of mass. Unfortunately, we didn't have a TE probe that time. Intraoperatively, as it was a 6.7 into 2.9 centimeter mass, injury to aortic valve cusp was uh, expected, leading to AR was also expected. Uh, the mass was uh, extracted in MSA through transiotic approach. So, next slide. Epicardial echocardiography was done to assess the aortic regurgitation and extent of clot extraction, which was done, but there was no AR. The patient was successfully weaned off from CPV with minimal supports. Post-operative course was uneventful. This is the epicardial echo LV long axis view. We can clearly see the LV cavity devoid of the LV mass. 
this is a lv ot long lv long axis you can see that uh, mitral valve inflow there is no mass clearly removed and the cavity also devoid of the mass in the right uh, diagram we can see the uh, coapting leaflets without any air this is also the another view i am not able to play the videos so sorry for that we can clearly see the lv cavity devoid of the mass next coming to the discussion it is an interesting case published in american journal of respiratory and critical care medicine the rare presentation of covid-19 hypercoagulability with lv thrombus dr rosa we are short of time can you come to the conclusion because yes, we have already all to the time disposing cardiac conditions lv thrombus can lead to lv thrombus can be expected in a patient with large anterior wall mi if not recognized and treated immediately echocardiogram is a simple and expensive technique next sir This is an uh, published in the British Journal. Clearly explained the pathophysiology with the issue, which shows triad of subendocardial injury, hypercoagulability, LV regional wall, echinacea, dyskinesia with stasis leading to LV thrombus formation. Next, sir. Main risk factor is the large uh, infarct. Can, can you can you come to the conclusion, please? Yeah, sir. Conclusion. Uh, next slide. Okay. Conclusion: An unusual, an unusual, incidentally found large LV clot in an young obese patient was completely extracted without injury to aortic valve pass under epicardial echocardiography guidance. In view of COVID-19 pandemic, we have, we can expect acute MI in an young patient even without any risk factors. Thank you, sir. Kumar Bilani, sir. Good presentation. Uh, even though you could not play the videos. the uh, when you have these patients now with the covid what do you think is the cause of this thrombus and did you give this patient thromboprophylaxis after the surgery so he doesn't do this again yes yeah, sir we have started him on warfarin sir okay so yeah, you think sir, in this case it was european and american heart association guidelines vitamin 4a antagonists are beneficial sir when compared to anticoagulants so we have started him on warfarin 2 mg sir was he also vaccinated against covid before he came to the no, hospital sir, no sir actually he is uh, he was not unaware of covid infection sir whatever uh, we got in the march he took just symptomatic treatment that's it sir after coming here during for, like for acl test surgical evaluation we have done all the investigations in that antibodies were positive even rt pcr is also negative okay manisha madam a very quick question from you well uh, why was uh, the clot not removed through the lv cavity ma'am the clot is extra I mean, into the why through the aorta when it was so big and it was an infarcted uh, left ventricle yeah ma'am actually clot is uh, encroaching the lv ot so our surgeon decided to remove it as an en mass or in pieces through aortic approach ma'am trans aortic approach okay If thank you thank you maybe sir would have done that thank you dr roza uh, you may uh, switch off your video and i request thank you, thank uh, you sir, sir the next uh, presenter dr aluri sojanya to to share the screen and present the case see good morning sir good morning sir can i start yes, yes. so good morning good morning everyone here i am presenting an unusual finding after a mitral valve repair in our setting so here is a brief history a 45 year old male presented with chest pain on exertion with palpitations and giddiness since one week he has nil comorbidities and on arrival his vitals were 82 beats, beats per minute heart rate and bp of 120 by 70 so he was evaluated in our uh, hospital and pre op uh, trans thoracic echo findings revealed mitral wall prolapse myxomatous leaflets with bileaflet prolapse and which is causing severe mitral regurgitation with redundant cordae this is leading to dilated la and lv with borderline lv function of ef 50 to 55% and normal rv function of tapc 18 so plan of the surgery was to repair the mitral wall so we took the patient into the operation theater and following all the standard guidelines psa and informed consent adequate blood and products were arranged 
and all the standard monitors were uh, fixed and general anesthesia with invasive monitoring was carried on. So after inducing the patient, the transesophageal echo was done and these are the findings. The first video is showing the mid-esophageal five chamber view. This is showing the P1 and P2, a P1 and A1 uh, billowing with P1 prolapse. This is causing the mitral regurgitation jet, which is moderate to severe. The second video is showing the mid-esophageal commissural view in which we can see the P3 is prolapsing. And uh, the third video is showing the mid-esophageal two-chamber view in which we can see the prolapse of P3 segment. And the fourth video is showing the mid-esophageal LV long axis view. We, here we can see the coaptation point is above the annular plane with prolapse of both A2 and P2. So all the measurements were taken before the repair. The AML length was found to be 3.25 centimeter. PML length was 1.71 centimeter. The coaptation point to the septal distance was two centimeter. So the AML by PML length was 1.1 and the annulus is 3.44 centimeter. All these measurements are in favor of predicting the post repair systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet. So median sternotomy was done and after heparinization we went on bypass. Core cooling was started, iota was cross clamped and root cardioplasia was given. Transeptal approach was used to repair the mitral wall. So the mitral wall was inspected intraoperatively. There was gross prolapsing of the P2 segment, which was resected by quadrangular resection technique. An annular reduction was done using 34 mm medrotonic profile 3D annuloplasty ring. So uh, after the post repair, while coming off bypass, we have performed TE, TE for the first time. And this showed as we are seeing in the first video, there is uh, some segment of the P2 resected P2 segment, which is found in the LVOT tract, which is causing a significant obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract. The second video is also showing the mediesophageal long axis view, where we can clearly see a part of, a part of the resected P2 segment with attached cordae, which is hanging in the LV cavity, which is significantly causing the LV outflow tract obstruction. And we have measured the LV outflow tract obstruction and it came out as uh, LVOT gradient of 93.4 mm HE, which is significant. So the P2 quadrangular resection is a common surgical technique which is adapted here for especially in exomatous elongated PML in the mitral wall repair. But in this case, the prolapsed resected P2 segment with attached native cordae was found to cause LVOT obstruction post repair, which was observed in the post bypass transesophageal echo. So again, CPB was reinstituted and that lion segment of P2 was removed. So again, after coming off bypass, we have done transesophageal echo and this showed a clear LVOT tract uh, with no turbulence along the uh, LV outflow tract and uh, the MR also, and there is nice coaptation between A2 and P2, which we can see in this mediesophageal four chamber view. The second, uh, if, the second video is also showing the mediesophageal five chamber view, where we can see the nice coaptation of A A1 and P1, and the left ventricular outflow tract is clear of any obstruction. So, to conclude, numerous complications we have seen after post MV repair, but in this case, a part of the resected P2 segment with attached cordae was itself causing LVOTO obstruction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aluri. Dr. Manisha, please. That was a nice case uh, and uh, well uh, and timely detected uh, by you, you all. Uh, was this uh, also leading LV obstru LVOT obstruction leading to uh, uh, mitral regurgitation? Because you yes, haven't ma shown uh, in the images that there was a typical picture of SAM or not. Was there yes, There was? There was an MR uh, after LV, uh, after coming off, we have seen after the first uh, mitral wall repair, after coming off, I couldn't see, I couldn't show you the, with the color image, but there was an MR. 
there was severe no ma'am moderate okay Okay. Were you on on some inotropes or what manure? Could you have tried to if it is uh, thought of to be a sham? Ma'am, uh, sir, according uh, to the guidelines, if it was a sham, uh, we'll measure the LVOT gradient. And if the LVOT gradient is less than fifty mm Hg and it is only mild to moderate uh, MR, we can treat it. Uh, we can try treating it medically by adequately preloading the LV. Reducing the inotropes and uh, reducing the heart rate, and again uh, look at the hemodynamics of the patient. But if it is like uh, the SAM is causing severe LVOT gradient of uh, greater than fifty to sixty mm Hg, and it is moderate to severe uh, mitral regurgitation, then uh, we we'll, we have to again reinstitute the CPV and uh, correct that SAM. Okay, Kumar will answer quickly. Yes, yeah, this is exactly why we use, we need to use echo during surgery for these valve cases, because you want to pick up items like you just picked up on this case. So yes, we're definitely helping the surgeon. So well done. Thank you, thank you, Doctor uh, uh, Aluri. Now thank you can you, uh, switch off your video, and I request uh, Doctor Manjusha to share the screen and present the case. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning. Uh, am I audible and yes. visible? Uh, good morning, respected judges and my dear colleagues. Today, I would like to share my experience with echo-guided perventricular per device closure of a ventricular septal rupture. Um, uh, ventricular septal rupture, even in the current era, has a high mortality. Surgical closure is a definite treatment, although transcutaneous septal closure is attempted in selected patients. Our case report describes the role of echocardiography in uh, uh, with um, epicardial and transcendental echocardiography with 3D imaging, which was able to guide successful perventricular closure in this case. Our patient was a 53-year-old diabetic lady with a previous anterior wall myocardial infarction, which was lysed outside. Uh, apical ventricular septal rupture was detected on post infarct day 7, and she was referred to a center for management. She was initially stabilized with nitrates, heparin, antiplatelets, and supported therapy. There was no evidence of endocrine dysfunction. Her coronary angiogram showed a single vessel disease in the LAD, and the right heart catheterization showed a significantly increased shunt. QPQS was 2.5. So, preoperative transfer echocardiogram showed a 6 millimeter defect in the interventricular septum with a left to right shunt. In addition, there was hypokinesia of the mid and apical anterior wall and interventricular septum. Her ejection fraction was 50%. There was mild MR, AR, moderate TR with moderate pulmonary hypertension. So following a multidisciplinary team meet, we decided to proceed with a perventricular closure of the VSR with a single vein graft to LED. Uh, general anesthesia following general anesthesia, endotechnical intubation and control ventilation. Interoperative TE was done with an X7-2T, uh, 3D TE probe with a Philips 7C ultrasound system. Epicardial echo was with the X-matrix probe, which was prepared in a sterile sheet. So uh, the 7 millimeter uh, ventricular substitute rupture was demonstrated in the transcastic LV short axis view with the shunt from left to right. And a similar short axis view of the LV on epicardial echo was obtained, showing the shunting from left to right. Uh, accurate position of the uh, accurate VST morphology in terms of location, size, and shape of the VST was obtained using 3D TE MPR mode. And based on this, an unplugged muscular VST occluder of waist diameter 10 millimeter was selected. So the panel on the right is showing. Um, the right hand panel is showing the epicardial image, which is obtained with the probe position on the heart. And the guide wire is shown crossing the VSR into the LV with and with a color flow doppler. Uh, the left hand panel shows um, core panel view obtained on full volume 3D color using TE, where the sheet is correctly positioned in the short axis view and in the long axis view in the left ventricle. The following adequate position, LV disc was deployed in the LV short axis and long axis view on epicardial echocardiography. Uh, the following video shows the VST morphology. In the end phase view, you can see that in systole it is circular, and in diastole it is uh, the shape changes to an elliptical shape. The 
Next image is showing the surgeon's hand on the VSR. The guide wire is crossing the VSR into the LV, epicardial short axis and long axis view. And the delivery sheath is being deployed through the guide wire into the left ventricle through the VSR. And this was guided by epicardial echocardiography in the short axis and long axis view using biplane imaging. And this was the uh, epicardial uh, full volume mode showing the positioning of the sheath in the mid LV in the short axis and long axis frames. Epicardial four chamber view showing the LV disc which was positioned correctly and the TE view four chamber view showing the same position of the LV disc. The device was deployed showing in the epicardial short axis view with color flow topper showing a trivial shunt and same thing was seen on TE also. This is the LV four chamber view and the long axis view. This is the 3D color flow imaging on full volume, which is showing a good device position and trivial shunt. And the uh, TE two chamber and four chamber view showing for the ventricular function following the LED graft. So post-procedure recovery was uneventful. She was discharged on post-operative day five and post-operative transfer as echo showed good device position. She has successfully completed an uneventful two-year follow-up to date. So in this case, we were able to successfully close the BSR and achieve complete coronary revascularization in the single setting. And we were able to avoid the risks of CPB and also complications in percutaneous device closure. So to conclude, intraoperative 3D TE imaging helped in accurate pre-procedural planning for guiding and monitoring device deployment and to confirm the final device position. Epicardial echo provided additional imaging in addition to TE, and we were able to use multiple 3D imaging modes for this. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first report of a combined epicardial and transesophageal echo with 3D imaging for successful perventricular closure of the post infarct PSR. Thank you. Uh, good presentation, Dr. Madhusha. It's uh, indeed uh, must be a rare case. You did this procedure in a hybrid OT or uh, just in the same, same operation theater without uh, radiology support? Uh, we did it in our in our, in our regular cardiothoracic OT. There was no radiology support in this case. So no cath lab, no, no, only the 3D echo and epicardial echo yes, and the surgeon. Echo and epicardial echo were used. And okay. surgeons performed it. And it was, yeah, surgeons performed it under echo cardiothoracic. The device was placed by surgeon, not the cardiologist. Uh, the, uh, as you can see in the images, the... Um, uh, the surgeon helped in stabilizing the device was deployed through the delivery sheet by the cardiologist. Okay. It was a team approach where the cardiologist, the cardiac surgeon, and the anesthesia team and echo team was equally involved. Did you keep the CPB ready or patients scannulated if there is any anything goes wrong? The, the CPB machine was primed and kept ready, but we didn't do a cannulation. And if, if cannulation Rajesh, required, yes. Sorry to interrupt. I think you'll have to. Yes. Go for the next paper straight away and finish. Last question by Dr. Manisha, if she can ask quickly, 20 seconds. There's no time. There's no time. Okay. Uh, as the organizer says, we are short of time. We go to the uh, next presenter. Presenter, Thanks, Dr. Manisha. Thank Manjusha, you. you can switch off your video. Dr. Kamla Panel. Uh, can Thank you, you Manjusha. Dr. Kamla Kanan, can you share the screen and present the case? Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. I am audible. Yeah, you are audible. Share the screen and present. Uh, start with you. Good morning, sir. I am here to discuss an interesting case of LV mass solved by TE. Uh, start with the introduction. The intracardial myxomas are most common tumors uh, and rare of the heart. Uh, incidence are uh, 0.5 per million population per year. Left ATM is the commonest. 80% of them are left ATM. Right ATM is 7 to 20%. And uh, right, vent uh, right and left ventricle is considered for 10%. In some of the article, even it comes down to 3 to 5%. Most of them are benign. Uh, a case history, a 36-year male presented with the right upper limb and 
right lower limb weakness and difficulty in swallowing for a week and known case of uh, hemocystinemia on regular treatment on examination a feeble right upper limb uh, right radial and right dorsal speed is artery and on system examination cns uh, muscle power 3 by 5 in right upper limb and lower limb the baseline investigations are normal angiogram neck and intracranial vessels acute non hemorrhagic infarct and left mca and suspected infarct and left parietal and temporal lobe MRI brain, non hemorrhagic infarct, and the left MCA, tertiary, and cardiac MRI showed scar in the apical septum other than the T uh, and uh, two masses have been confirmed, which are uh, 1.7 into 1.2 centimeter, another mobile masses, 1.2 into 1.2 centimeter, which both of them in the apex of the heart. And Doppler lower limb, monophysic flow with reduced peak systolic velocity in the anterior. And posterior tibial arteries. This is a preoperative transthoracic epical four chamber view showing the <coughs> two masses. One is attached to the apex, another one is apical interventricular septum. This is a uh, transthoracic parasternal short axis view showing the uh, both masses are moving freely within the LV cavity. Uh, provisional diagnosis as a right hemiparesis with peripheral vascular disease associated with suspected LV clot. The point against the thrombolysis is carries high risk for hemorrhagic or embolic complication. Pedunculated globular thrombi with narrow stalks and moving freely within the LV gravity have a high chance of embolization. So we plan to excise surgically through, uh, through the trans atrial approach. Interoperatively under general anesthesia, we was placed a uh, T was placed and the findings were confirmed through medial stenotomy with moderate hypothermia using cardiopulmonary bypass. LV mass was entire mass was removed uh, with a safety margin, exhibited on table without new neurological deficit. This is the intraoperative four-chamber transthoracic echograph mid-esophageal view showed there is a LV mass which is uh, showing both the masks are moving and normal functioning well. This is an interoperative transgastric short axis view, apical view, which shows that we confirm that both masks are moving freely. This is a post removal uh, of a mask, which shows there is no residual LV mass in the LV cavity and normal functioning mitral and tricuspid valve. Then post-surgery patient was shifted to the surgical ICU with a low dose of dobutamine. Post-op TE, no residual clot, normal LV RV function, normal functioning valve. And the patient was discharged from the hospital on post-op day eight, was well and discharged. Histopathology later come as a myxoma. These are all the images, uh, transthoracic images, post-op, short axis, uh, epical fourth chamber, parasternal long axis. We have showed that there is no residual myxomas or uh, any other abnormal pathology. Discussion, LV myxomas is a rare presentation, common in female, present in the fifth and sixth decade, but presented early in our patient. Most of them are pedunculated and solitary, but both of them are presented in our case. Myxomas are more precisely seen by TE than TTE. These are some of the published articles, but unique to our case, LV myxoma associated with homocystinemia, which leads homocystinemia condition, which leads to systemic embolization. It's with a recent stroke that is very less than a B. Dr. Kamla Kanan, can you come to conclusion? We are already conclusion is LV myxoma is extremely rare cardiac tumor. T is very useful diagnosis and removing the myxoma. This helped a patient to recover completely with the further worsening the neurological deficit. These are my reference. There is no conflict of interest. Thank you. Yeah, you can unshare the screen. Uh, as I've been told by the organizers that we are very short of time and we are already running late. Uh, Dr. Pranati, uh, because of technical glitch, we could not take your uh, uh, paper. Definitely. 
uh, and I'll request all the three judges to give their final concluding remark in one or two sentences. From my side, all presenters have done a very good job, very hard work, and we wish them all good luck. Next time, they will be part of. I wish they are part of uh, the. I mean, uh, competitive sessions of Janak, uh, this uh, Golden Fate or uh, research paper. Good luck to all of you. Do a good job. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Manisha, do you want to say something before yes, we close? I want, I, I want to wish all the candidates uh, good luck and they did a good uh, job. And uh, soon I'm sure they would be giving FTE exam and getting accredited. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, I agree with both Dr. Rajesh Arya and also Manisha that you guys did a fabulous, awesome job. Keep it up. And uh, I'm very happy to see that this, this is happening with IACTA and the youngsters are coming ahead. And uh, it was a pleasure to moderate this session and wish you all the best. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. And thank you, Dr. Manisha. And thank you for the presenters. Thanks, Dr. And Murli, also, sir. And we close this session and back to the organizers the, and the uh, and Dr. Sujani to continue, please. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you Jordan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome back. I thank all the participants for their amazing and impressive presentations. A mighty thank you to Dr. Rajesh Arya, Dr. Kumar Bellani, and Dr. Manisha Mishra for your contributions. Your presence here definitely enriched this session. Moving on to our next session, which includes the talk about the wider applications of ultrasound in assessment of the lung and diaphragm, the role of echocardiography in mitral clip placement, and the hemodynamic TEE. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Prabhavati, who is Dr. Hi. B.C. Roy Award winner, currently the professor of cardiology at Sri Jayadeva Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences at Bangalore, to introduce the panelist and continue with the session. Kindly step in, Dr. Prabhavati. Uh, doctor, uh, I think we'll have to switch the link now. Okay, we are off okay. now. Yeah. We, are off. we are offline now. The videos are uh, Just a second, doctor. Thank you.